Mapping History, a roundtable discussion about historical geographic information systems research in Canada. Uh, well, a GIS, I guess, is uh, easily described as a geographically enabled database in some sense, or uh, geographically positioned images as well. So in a sense, uh, HGIS is, is past geographies put into databases and images that are geolocated. I'm Sean Courage, and you're listening to episode 46 of Nature's Past, a podcast of the Network in Canadian History and Environment. In recent years, environmental historians and other historians have been working with maps in new ways. Specifically, they've been using HGIS software, that is, Historical Geographic Information Systems software. You may have heard a bit about this already. HGIS has allowed historians to take historical data and visualize and analyze it spatially. This allows a researcher to present evidence in new ways, but perhaps more significantly, it provides novel approaches to the analysis of historical data. HGIS can be a methodology in and of itself. We can see things in the data with HGIS that we couldn't see before. HGIS research has taken off in the field of environmental history. More researchers have been using HGIS as part of what some have called a spatial turn in scholarship. Census data, municipal assessment roles, aerial photographs, just to take a few examples, can be analyzed and presented in new ways spatially with HGIS software. Now, getting started with HGIS can be intimidating, and it often requires collaboration among historians, geographers, librarians, and other scholars. To help researchers in the field of environmental history get acquainted with the uses of this technology, the University of Calgary Press and the Network in Canadian History and Environment have published a new book called Historical GIS Research in Canada. To find out more, I met up with the editors of this book, Jennifer Bennell and Marcel Fortin, as well as a couple of the contributors. My name is Jennifer Bennell, and I teach in the History Department at McMaster University. Um, I t- I'm teaching Canadian history and environmental history. I'm Marcel Fortin. I'm the GIS and Map Librarian at the University of Toronto's Map and Data Library, and I also teach in the Geography Department at the University of Toronto. I am John Lutz. I teach history at the University of Victoria, and um, my research focuses on the history of uh, settler Aboriginal relations and the history of race. I am Josh McFadgen. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Saskatchewan, where I study environmental history agricultural history, agroecosystems, and use GIS to do all of the above. Well, we're all here together to talk about this new book, Historical GIS Research in Canada, uh, a book that Jennifer and Marcel uh, edited and contributed one of the chapters, and and John and Josh have contributed chapters to this book. And uh, I wanted to get a bit of a sense about the creation of this book and some of the case studies, but maybe we need to lay down some groundwork for listeners who may not be initiated into the realm of historical GIS. What exactly is that? Jennifer, can you give a little bit of an explanation of HGIS to our listeners? Um, well, I may have to uh, call upon the technical expertise of, um, of Marcel and perhaps Josh here, but historical GIS, HGIS stands for Historical Geographic Information Systems. And uh, Marcel has a very handy-dandy definition that I'll, that I'll ask him to, uh, to share with us. Uh, well, a GIS, I guess, is uh, easily described as a geographically enabled database in some sense, or uh, geographically positioned images as well. So in a sense, uh, HGIS is, is past geographies put into databases and images that are geolocated. So we're talking about historical databases like census data or any other kind of historical information that can be geographically referenced? Yeah, certainly census information is one of the the large uh, uh, bodies of of work that have have been focused on, especially here uh, in Canada. Some of the first HGIS were certainly uh, lots of census information uh, gathered for Montreal, for instance. Um, and then uh, expanded upon in, in huge ways, especially now with uh, with more uh, uh, different types of historians uh, undertaking HGIS. You're seeing a lot of different types of databases being compiled and geogra- geographically uh, grounded. So my sense has been that HGIS is um, 
relatively new, at least to historians, as a, as a technique, as a methodology, or as a way of displaying historical data. Uh, Marcel and Jen, can you give us a sense of how you came to uh, uh, edit this anthology of, of uh, essays? Yeah, maybe I can weigh in on that. Um, this the, the idea for this book really emerged out of our collaborative work on a project called the Don Valley Historical Mapping Project. And I um, was working on my, my, my doctoral degree on a dissertation on the history of the, of the Don River Valley in Toronto and was struggling to come to terms with the really complex um, history of change on the ground in this urban watershed. So I had spent a lot of time in the reference library, the Toronto Reference Library, um, <laughs> photocopying and taping together uh, giant um, <laughs> mosaics of fire insurance plans and then trying to, uh, you know, layer them in a really mechanical way, how to layer paper. Mm. You, you know, you can't see through it. I knew, I knew at the time there had to be a better way to do this, but I wasn't entirely sure of how. Um, and certainly the reference library wasn't making it apparent as to how I might um, better visualize change over time in mm -hmm. this particular part of the city. It was actually um, struggles with, here you get the sense of my, my technological savvy, struggles with downloading a particular kind of image file from the Map and Data Library at, at the University of Toronto that led me to meet Marcel um, to help me with that file download. We came to talking about my project um, and realized that it was a really golden opportunity, not only for me, but for the Map Library um, to work together. So... Mm. I was seeking historical spatial information about the Don Valley, trying to access uh, historical maps and to somehow put this information into some visual uh, space to help me comprehend that change. And Marcel, as I'm sure he, he can tell you more, was looking for a way to showcase um, the riches of the map library uh, in a way that would be accessible to a wider range of researchers. So maybe I'll turn it over to him from there. Um, and, and it wasn't simply to just showcase some of our, our collections. It was, uh, it was a way of showing how collections from different places could also come together, but also showing, uh, my motive is to also show how librarianship has changed a lot and how uh, we're part of the research process and some of our services can actually help in, um, in, in developing uh, specific projects or, or, or supporting even specific dissertations like this one. Uh, and another motive was also to actually try and make things more accessible. Uh, in, in the age of open access, I, I really believe that what we create and what we build should be made visible and, and accessible to the public. And that, that was certainly a motivating factor for me to get involved, was to be able to build data that I could then distribute out there. And in a lot of ways, that's, I think, how the book occurred as well, is that it, it was about openness. And, and interestingly, the I, niche was really uh, 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 active in this field. And with the press as well, uh, uh, being involved in open access, it all has really been a lot about openness and about sharing. Yeah, and just just to to add to that briefly, um, how the how the book emerged from the project was mm. as we were working on um, bringing all this data together on georeferencing these maps, on building uh, a user interface, a, a website where you could access this material freely. We we came up against that problem of of, you know, we have questions and how to proceed on various fronts of the project. And we wanted to know what other researchers, what other teams of researchers, multidisciplinary as ours was, um, you know, how they had addressed the same kinds of challenges that we were addressing. And so the, the book really emerged quite organically from the project. Let's, let's find out what other GIS projects across the country, um, first of all, which, what's out there, and second, what kind of challenges have they encountered? So with that real uh, need for information, um, the book really emerged quite organically from that. It's a really impressive collection. It covers um, the entirety of the country, and it has a really impressive range of scale as well, from very small micro-studies of, of tiny geographic areas to um, the entirety of Canada. 
uh, itself. So I'm thinking of Josh's uh, research on Prince Edward Island, not to say that Prince Edward Island is tiny, but it is relatively small compared to the entirety of Canada, like in uh, the chapter by Ruth Sandwell on, uh, on energy history. Um, the structure of the book is really interesting, too. Was it deliberate to ask the contributors to make these pieces sort of uh, reflective essays about the process of using historical GIS in their research? I think I think very much so. We were we were interested. Um, prime, we were interested. The book really stresses collaboration, and so we were interested in how not only researchers from different fields work together. So typically, historians and geographers and historians working in different fields, but mm-hmm. also um, how different um, professional groups work together. So librarians with um, faculty members in different uh, research fields. So there's a real emphasis on collaboration here, and there's an emphasis in process in how people approached and um, and moved through various challenges. And I think the nature of how the book's organized, you can see it moves from, from west to east in, in terms of the table of contents uh, and then looks to some uh, nationwide examples uh, that, that just shows the, the, yeah, the breadth of the collection. So maybe we can open up the conversation a little bit to everybody on the panel. I wanted to know uh, what you thought the potential advantages of HGIS uh, are for environmental historians. Sure, I'll jump in and, and say that just to reiterate, a lot of those things are, are true about building a community and uh, bringing together a whole bunch of different people. But I think this book is really one of the first times that uh, a large, kind of diverse community of scholars have uh, have gotten together and and I know there's the Historical Atlas of Canada and other major projects from the eight, late 80s and 90s, but uh, this is first. It's the first time that it's got a digital uh, component that's it's uh, freely available online, and it's an excellent uh, quality publication. Really brought together um, geographers and historians, uh, environmental historians and librarians, um, a lot of different people, and so I think to uh, Jennifer and Marcel's credit, they really kind of guided that from the beginning, used a uh, uh, niche grant and you know, it looks like University of Toronto uh, support to um, to get a lot of different people in the same room. And we literally did have a, a meeting in the same place and people got to compare their approaches and, uh, and their methods. And then as well as, uh, and say, neither, I guess, neither side of the field or the multidisciplinary uh, approaches really pushed or shaped the others too much. I guess it was all really good, really good cooperation. And, uh, um, and there were people, you know, private sector or, uh, or I guess government sector, including my co-author who, who, um, who came in and said, you know, maybe you should be looking a little bit harder at uh, some of these questions of, of projection or analysis or some questions that probably some of us had never heard of, but uh, <laughs> um, it really, I think that, should emphasize how well the the community came together in this space of a couple of years and then produced a really excellent work out of it. And John, do you what, what advantages do you see or did you see to the use of HGIS as a historical methodology? Yeah, so I guess I you know I'm an ethno historian in some ways and a cultural historian and labor historian and not so much on the environmental side um, where where I've seen uh, you know amazing use of uh, GIS including in this volume. So uh, on the cultural side, um, you know I think the more ways we have to come at our data, the better. Uh, I, you know some of the other kinds of work I do is textual analysis and. You, you look at uh, the newspaper accounts of race and you get a perspective of how, uh, you know, people talked about race in, in the 19th century. And you form a perspective of what racism must have looked like. Um, uh, and that's like our only lens on the world. But if mm-hmm. once we uh, open that up to spatial history and, and see, can we spatialize race? Can we look at race, the questions of how people lived race? Um, spatially or uh, in their neighborhoods, uh, who their neighbors were, who they lived in the house with. It, it It's a whole different kind of lens and it produces different kinds of, both different kinds of answers, which is what you kind of notice first. Mm-hmm. And then, you, then then it produces different kinds of questions because you see things you never saw before and you want to explain them. So I, that leads me right into my next question for your case study of Victoria, which I found to be a really fascinating opening chapter in the book. Um, but what what did HGIS techniques allow you to see in terms of the spatial history of race in Victoria? 
So we look back at the history of Victoria racially, and one of the, the sort of main racialized groups in the city were a small black population, a uh, um, historic, uh, long um, extant Aboriginal population, and starting in the 1850s, a, a, a small but then growing to a significant size Chinese population, and of course the whole racialized white population. And um, we have a Chinatown in Victoria, one of the oldest Chinatowns, well, it is the oldest in Canada, one of the oldest in North America. And there are several written books written about it, and they all use the trope of the Forbidden City. Mm-hmm. This was a strange and exotic place that uh, uh, whites were afraid to go into. Chinese used it protectively. They, they kind of had all these traps and hidden doors to evade the police. And anyways, so this is uh, – and, and it points to a certain – idea of race that's very hermetically sealed that you're Chinese or you're not and if you're Chinese you live in the Forbidden City and nobody else does so spatializing that so we took the Canadian census and 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 through a various uh, uh, mechanisms because people didn't actually have street addresses in 1880 and all kinds of complicated um, ways uh, managed to locate just about everybody in the city in 1881 and 1891 1901 1911 to their homes and then we could see where did all the Chinese live. And it turns out that the Forbidden City wasn't so forbidden, that about a quarter of the people who, who lived in the Forbidden City weren't Chinese, hmm. um, that about a quarter of the Chinese didn't live in the Chinese quarter, if you like, and that there were streets in Chinatown that were, you know, Aboriginal, Scottish, uh, Belgian, French, Chinese, uh, you know, neighbors all side by side. And it, it, it has made me rethink the whole idea of what race looked like in, in British Columbia in the 19th century. This is a, a, quite an incredible finding, right? I mean, a, a really good example of the utility of the technique. But it makes me wonder how then do you reconcile the textual analysis with the geographic analysis? So that, to me, is uh, uh, the really exciting part of the, the, the kind of GIS work that we're doing. We're doing the GIS work as one lens and using the textual analysis as the other. And with the new insights from the spatial history, we went back to the text and started to ask questions in a different kind of way. So instead of reading the newspapers and looking for everything they said about Chinese that kind of um, uh, was pejorative, we said, well, let's let's uh, take a more social scientific approach, maybe a more like a HGIS of text. Let's map every reference to Chinese. Hmm. And when we did that, we found out that, sure, there was uh, some negative commentary about the Chinese. There was some positive commentary about the thrifty and other positive values of the Chinese. And by and large, most of the commentary was not reflective at all of um, positive or negative characterizations. So, for example, many ads were Chinese businessmen advertising for, you know, trying to get white customers or uh, or a commentary about a Chinese funeral that wasn't racialized one way or another. And and uh, so the two, the two insights started to come together. What we're seeing if we take a, a look at the full scope of the text is actually a a, a geography of Texas, not so dissimilar than the geography of how people lived. This was a, a transactional space where whites and Chinese interacted as customers and clients and uh, workers for each other. Uh, a small aside, there was a bit of a scandal in Victoria when white women went to work in Chinese restaurants. You know, this is just mm-hmm. not good uh, from the point of view of the larger white society. But lots of examples, of course, of, white, of Chinese working in white households. Mm-hmm. Anyway, to make a long story short, um, when we look at it, thanks to the benefit of the GIS, we can see that uh, the racial discourse is much more mixed. It's much more uh, interactive and engaged and not at all hermetically sealed. And it creates this image, I think, of Victoria in the 19th century that it's much more complex and much more cosmopolitan at less in in a sense in terms of the mixing and, com- and composition of, of people who lived in the city at that time yes and and it it makes me uh, adjust the whole uh, vision of of race because race operates you know it's such a complex thing race and operates at so many levels but there was um there was a level of Chinese and, and white interactions uh, that happened in Victoria that was almost independent of race. Um, mm. And and when we turn our attention to First Nations or to the other racialized groups, 
the picture is different, but the complexity that emerges, again, thanks to being able to spatialize this as well, um, that part is similar. Now, I want to shift gears now to Josh's case study, because I think the case study of Victoria and Josh's uh, case study, which was co-authored with uh, William Glenn, his top-down history, um, have some similarities in terms of taking textual sources and um, using G- uh, GIS techniques to see them in new ways. Now, Josh, uh, your chapter uses census records combined uh-huh. with aerial photography as data for spatial analysis of agricultural development and deforestation and PEI. What did your case study reveal? Well, yes, I used air photos, as you pointed out, and ever, lots of historians have used census data oh, for, for decades in Canada. And what I wanted to do was kind of add a new layer, just like Jennifer had found kind of combing through the archives, a new layer of information to that, because I was after, I was looking for land use and land cover change in agriculture and Prince Edward Island was uh, was a good case study for uh, the kind of larger problems I was working on at that point. So what I found was that, I mean, I say air photos let us see environmental history from the top down, as it were. So switching the social history um, uh, expression there. But what I found was that as um, GIS professionals had used the historical air photos to recreate a forest inventory, so a, a land use, but especially forest inventory uh, for the province of Prince Edward Island, which is a very small half a million hectares of land um, jurisdiction in eastern Canada, the small, country's smallest province. Um, what they had found is that at its peak, um, by looking at the forest outlines from the oldest air photos in the 1930s, and by actually taking a, a little method where they looked at square forests, they looked at forests that looked like fields, right, the, by their shape and their and their composition, and they stripped those away, and they said that at one point these had been cleared uh, land, and they said that about 64% or 360,000 hectares of the province had been cleared. But when I looked at the census, I realized that the census was at its highest point a good 50,000 hectares short of that. So there was a discrepancy. Um, and what I wanted to do was with the help of uh, William Glenn and the, and the provincial GIS lab was to compare that year by year. And it became a sort of a methodological um, uh, tour de force, I guess, and, or Everest. And we, uh, we climbed it year by year. And, and what I had to do was compare, um, take the census and compare it to the inventory. And that might sound tedious, but what it does is it actually shows over a long run how farmers were reporting and systematically re- misreporting the uh, the area of land that they had under production. So you can think of all kinds of reasons why they would do this. Now, there's estimates that in China it's as high as 50% error. Uh, and so, so you say, well, how can we trust any data then? Well, the one way to do it is by getting a good sense of uh, what farmers were uh, and how badly they were they were misreporting their land. And so what we found was that the number was between 6 and 12%, depending on how you estimated it. But So let's say you know, you're 10% short on the amount of land that you're reporting to the census. So well, now, that, now that we know that that's the case for PEI in the 20th century, we can, um, we can imagine that similar uh, underreporting is occurring in other parts of Canada. And so it was a way to, to start that that uh, process of of looking at the census and looking at our historical uh, textual and and um, and tabular data in a new way, and by mm-hmm. using these air photos, I think we got a better view of it. So, is the hypothesis then that if you can get a sense of the average of the misreporting on the census, mm-hmm. that you can apply that outside of PEI potentially to get a more accurate sense of cleared land or developed land in other parts of the country? Yeah, absolutely, and I think for environmental historians, if you, uh, it's just a, it's a cautionary tale too. You don't just grab the census and flip it open to say 1960 and say here's how much cleared land there was in the province. Therefore, the forest was the opposite, uh, the number, right? Because what we found is that as the century progressed, there's fewer and fewer people farming, but lots of other people are owning land. So there are things happening on their land that aren't being recorded in the census. So it's a it's a cautionary tale for people using the census. Yes, you can use that. You can use the figures that we report in the chapter uh, for other parts of Canada, I would expect. And um, and you should, as you're using census information, remember that there are other sources out there, such as historical forest inventories, as one example, for getting at the uh, 
the the footprint or the land use the and the land cover in the areas that you're studying. So um, I would encourage people to use air photos, but uh, the best way to do it is in an HGIS. These two case studies, John and Josh's case studies, I think are really good examples of, of my experience reading this book, like a series of light bulbs going off in my head with each chapter and the way in which placing historical data into geographic space can allow you to see things in completely new ways. Um, but the other thing that's really obvious from the book, of course, and Jennifer, you mentioned this, is the collaborative nature of the research. And I want to ask uh, about some of the challenges or, or what the experience was like working in a multidisciplinary and collaborative uh, manner. And maybe I'll uh, start with uh, John. You had uh, two other co-authors on, uh, on your chapter. Is that right? Or is there three? Well, you make a really good point uh, in that these are collaborative projects. There's no way, uh, you know, a single scholar, at least like me, could handle the complexity of the project. And so uh, really uh, the, the chapter that I'm talking about is a real team effort. And, yes, we got two geographers, uh, Don Lafreniere and uh, Jason Gilliland, and two other historians, um, Patrick Denae and Megan Harvey, mm -hmm. uh, all uh, working on the project um, and not to mention a small army of research assistants as well. <laughs> so um, it is collaborative and um, uh, and necessarily so because, uh, you know, we can't be experts in text analysis and HGIS and historical context. And But you ask about some of the challenges. And, um, you know, I, I have to say I, I, this is an ongoing project for me. I'm still working on this project, and I find it very frustrating that I don't have all the technical skills that I would like to have to be able to just come up with a question and go into that HGIS data and roll it around. Uh, uh, I rely on my colleagues, the geography colleagues, uh, to, to do that for me. But it's, it's, a, you know, it's such a delayed process that it kind of kills uh, – <laughs> certain kinds of enthusiasms and and they're busy too so um so one of my life goals and aspirations is to <laughs> increase my technical capacity and step into their shoes for for a while um so that's one of the frustrations is as you know an expert in a certain area i don't have it in others and i feel that limitation as i get excited about using the the, the technology and the the, the software Maybe I can ask Marcel from the other side, from the geography and the library side, what's the experience like working with historians? Well, I, 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 my background is actually history, uh, and uh, I'm sort of an imposter in the geography world. <laughs> uh, and I have a master's in history, and so I, I feel, um, having worked with maps uh, from the history side, I, I, it's a natural fit for me mm. to, to build on the historical side, and I really, it, it's it's... It's one of my my uh, motivating uh, factors in in a lot of what I do is to make sure that people know that historians are in the map library. They do come to the map library. They use maps, and uh, so it, it it's a, a great time for me because enjoying the history and in, enjoying the te the technology and the geography. It, it, they all fit together for me, and it's it's almost impossible for me to do any kind of geography without thinking about it historically. So, in working with historians, it's it's just a very natural thing to do. Um, I think there's a lot of um, convincing to do, possibly with our our geographer friends, uh, to um, not necessarily think of things historically, but I think maybe. Uh, in the future, when when we're looking at a lot of these projects, is what can the historical new new historians and new ways of looking at history also affect the way geographers approach historical geography? Hmm. Um, that might be part part of what's in the future in in terms of collaboration. Well, I think the book is quite successful in demonstrating the benefits of sort of reaching out across disciplinary boundaries and thinking about producing. Um, historical research and geographic research that's collaborative in a sense. At least the output that I see in this book is quite fruitful, it seems to me. So, Can I add one, one thing to that? Just mm -hmm. from, the, from a totally different side, I've always told historians to not be afraid to contact uh, public servants, people in, people in the public sector who are mm. 
or in the in public service who are who are able and who have GIS expertise and and Marcel knows how often I uh, pester him with questions about GIS and historical maps. But <laughs> often, if you go to a jurisdiction who's really uh, who's working on all kinds of uh, varied topics, so Prince Edward Island was one example. But I've worked with uh, Ontario MNR Ministry of Natural Resources. Um, in other parts, they're, they're often very willing to share their uh, resources and sometimes their time. You know, I've had lots of people give an afternoon of their time to help me uh, figure out a problem. Or, And then William Glenn, who's a recently retired um, civil servant, so he, he worked with me through the whole project. But I've often encouraged historians, don't be afraid to just kind of go knocking. And you'll, you'll find, I, in my experience anyway, all kinds of support and help. Well, and especially with uh, uh, the mandate of, of librarians is to help in these kinds of things, as I mentioned earlier, and as Josh was just mentioning, um, you'll rarely see a, hear a librarian say no. Another angle to the um, to to public servants is that I have been approached by the city of Victoria to work with them um, to actually write some textual descriptions of maps which they have geo reference historical maps of, of Victoria and then put on a slider so you can slide back and forth and see contemporary Victoria mm-hmm. and then slide back to any about six different um, points in the past where we have maps. And uh, that, too, just, uh, A, it opens uh, the, the uh, a public, uh, if you like, knowledge transfer of the work we're doing in a way that's really exciting to the public. And I look at those maps and I say, oh, geez, I didn't know that's where that was. That makes me think of, and then I head off on a new research question. So, Well, while I have this group here for another few minutes, I wanted to ask what you think some of the potential future directions are for the use of HGIS in research in Canada? And maybe we'll start with Jennifer. Um, Well, I I can say that in my current research, I'm looking at uh, the history of agricultural modernization through the 20th century in Ontario and looking at, at beekeepers in particular as, as marginal producers um, and their, their intersection with this real really large land use change um, through that period. And I'm using working with, with GIS data to help me uh, try to visualize those changes in land use in the peri-urban areas, so the areas around cities and in rural areas, um, how, much, uh, how, much, how much green space was available, what kind of green space was available. And I, I think um, as I'm getting into this research, uh, seeing what, what historical GIS um, can bring me and what it can't uh, in terms of being able to understand um, what kind of spaces those were i can only the maps will only take me so far um but certainly i think there's great bodies of data available um that that haven't really been tapped into that much and some of those are some of the um the maps that were done for suburban areas through the 50s and 60s um as well as as the land use inventory data which i'm just beginning to dig into and um the problem is they don't go back that far. Mm. Um, so I'm really looking at post-war data and trying to um, access anything comparable I can make comparisons to um, in in the earlier part of the 20th century. That'll be one of the challenges I'm facing. Now, Josh, you're working on a project that is... Uh... That seems quite useful towards the growth of HGIS in the future and research in Canada called the Geospatial Historian. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So this was a sort of modeled after the Programming Historian, which was uh, one of the early and very successful projects on, on the Niche website. And uh, it's really uh, similar to the Programming Historian. It's a tutorial-based like open access textbook that that lets uh, users go on and, um, and find GIS products that are usually open source. Like you might find others, you might find some on there that are the industry standards that uh, require subscription licenses. And if you're at a university, you'll probably have access to those. But if you're not, there's uh, open source alternatives, and um, sometimes they're not quite as user friendly or as robust, but they are uh, they can get the job done. And so there's we we cover everything on there from Google products to uh, quantum GIS or QGIS. And in there, you can walk through uh, a few different tools. And you'll actually find this if you go to the niche-canada.org slash digital tools, um, uh, which I'm sure Sean will post the uh, uh, <laughs> link to on, on the show notes. But yeah. um, but there you'll find uh, at, the, at this point four 
or five different lessons, and soon we're going to have four or five more that will use the uh, the uh, Esri ArcGIS tools. And so that'll that'll walk you through some of the basic uh, uh, tasks in GIS, creating new vector layers. Or what is a vector? That that will all be explained to you there. And uh, and then one of the pro- one of the projects that historians do a lot of, and there's a lot of it in this book, is georeferencing. So taking a uh, taking a ordinary two-dimensional historical map and giving it geographic coordinates so that it can be opened and explored in a GIS. So that one, uh, that one's a pretty popular one on the site too. So, and then there's more to come and we're always looking for new uh, contributors. So anyone who can, who does historical GIS uh, in Canada or beyond is welcome to send us their ideas for lessons and, um, and add new tutorials to the site. Well, the think... geospatial historian seems like a great place uh, to go after reading uh, this book, I think. Um, Sean, if, if, if Marcel is still there, I think um, just ha- he might want to weigh in on this future directions question. Um, yeah, well, certainly the, the, the future of HGIS research, I think, is uh, dependent on being able to share our data and share our techniques and share our experiences like we did in our book. But uh, to further that, we're hoping to build that community further so that we can have a place to, to put uh, data sets that others can use and um, and link to things like the geospatial historian for adding techniques and and so on uh, and so we're hoping to to develop that through uh, through shirk funding uh, through the process uh, right now and everybody on this call uh, is uh, is uh, a, a collaborator or or um, or a co-applicant in uh, a shirt grant for uh, developing a HGIS network in Canada. Well, I encourage listeners to pick up a copy of Historical GIS Research in Canada. It's a book that is um, very practical, but also incredibly inspirational. And I'll say for myself after reading it that I couldn't look at my research materials in the same way. Every document and every source that I was using on my own current research, I started to imagine how I might be able to geo-reference it and what new things I could see by doing that. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us and letting us know a little bit about their contributions to this book and to let listeners know that we only scratch the surface of what's available in here. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, John. Thank you, Josh. And thank you, Marcel. Thanks Thanks so much, John. Nature's Past is produced with support from the Network in Canadian History and Environment. This episode was made by Jennifer Bunnell, Marcel Fortin, John Lutz, Josh McFadgen, and me, Sean Karash. Music for Nature's Past was licensed by Creative Commons. For details on the artists, please take a look at our show notes page at niche-canada.org slash nature's past, where you can also download new episodes, subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, and leave comments. Please let us know what you think about the podcast, and don't forget to rate and review this podcast on our iTunes page. You can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash nature's past. You can always get the latest information on events in the environmental history community from the Niche website at niche-canada.org, and you can find out more about the topics we discussed on this episode on our show notes page. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back soon with another episode of Nature's Past.